I just wanted to take this time to talk a little bit about making a, a, a video that was inspired by Lawrence Guntrier. We are honoring Kala Kala and his passing. It's been 131 years since he's passed. And we are claiming space by doing this video together. So thank you so much, Lawrence. I want to share the video real quick, just so you guys can get a feel he's inspired me to do and other scholars around Hawaii. So let me go ahead and share my screen, a really quick um, snippet of this video, and then we'll go from there. I ask you some uh, very random questions, if you don't mind, because um, I, you know, I, I think there, I think you're an interesting guy. I'm, in, I'm interested in you. And uh, have you ever met another Keanu? Yes. Oh, yeah, it was, I have a cousin. Oh, there's a I'm really? Hawaiian. I got a cousin. Everybody's got a cousin. And there's a cousin Keanu. And, I met, and I nobody met said, oh, we yeah. got a Keanu already. Maybe we should just stick with the one. Yeah, but I didn't I didn't meet that guy until I was probably eight or nine. Oh. So I had never heard that name for, for another human uh -huh. until that moment. And I was just like, wow, hey, Keanu. And I... For what I thought I knew was that Hawaii was a part of the United States and I'm in the army. <laughs> I'm in the field artillery. I began to realize then that what I thought I knew all of a sudden was not relevant anymore. Because what I found out, just from my military perspective, what happened in 1893, January 17th, was an illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, not the country. I mean, when the intel briefs that we received from, from uh, Desert Storm, there was a puppet government there set up by Iraq called the Provisional Government of Kuwait. And here I'm looking at Hawaii. There's these guys are calling themselves the provisional government of Hawaii. And then later, that provisional government of Kuwait, I knew changed its name to the Republic of Kuwait. And that's exactly what the provisional government did of Hawaii. They changed its name to the Republic of Hawaii. And then asked to be annexed just as the Republic of Kuwait was asking to be annexed. All right, so that's just a little little snippet there that I was inspired to make. It's it's a little long, it's about 20 minutes, but that's just a little preview. I'd love to turn the time over to the distinguished PhD, Lawrence Gunshore, for his presentation. Aloha, my kako. Um, thank you very much, um, Alex, for um, inviting me uh, today to uh, share some of my research uh, to honor um, King Kalakaua on uh, the anniversary of his passing. Thank you also very much for this great tour of the uh, of the Palace Hotel to see like, you know, really the, the place where it happened and, and, and see the traces of, of the Mu'i there. I mean, it's was, it was very, very inspiring, very, very deep. So mahalo nui for that. Just before I, uh, before I get into my first let me just briefly comment on that video you, you just shared. I mean, this is, I must say, I must say this is probably the best introduction to the topic. Like, I mean, the topic of, you know, occupation narrative. I mean, a lot of you, many probably in the audience know about that and they know about Keanu's research, you know, but the various other people who have done research like Ron Williams, Willie Kawai, and, and many other people who are actually in the video as well, Donovan Preza. And, and if you're new to this topic and you're new to the, to this issue about Hawaii being occupied this is really like this is really the one to go because it's like it's it's kind of starts very very simple and it comes from like these of these pop culture references and then you know makes the person connection through the through the matrix and through the person of Keanu Reeves and his cousin in Hawaii and so I think you know there it couldn't have been done better honestly like so any any of you guys so again thank you so much for putting this out there like to, to educate people and like I said like I would highly recommend anybody who's new to this like watch this video and then from there you can go to other because I know sometimes you might be overwhelmed if you watch a presentation of Dr. Sai and that's just like, you know, you, wow, this is like one hour of like hardcore international law, but it might be intimidating for somebody who is new to the topic. So that's why, like, like I said, like, you know, as a starter, you, your, your video, like 20 minutes, just get to the topic. So that's just like my brief comment on that. But without further ado now, let me get to my own presentation that I'm going to do today and where I'm going to talk about Kinkalakawa and one of the most important parts of his legacy in uh, Hawaiian and Pacific politics. So in order to honor today's uh, anniversary, 
131st anniversary of the passing of the beloved, beloved Mo'i Kalakawa. Um, I would like to um, give this presentation to, um, you know, to put some, uh, shed some light on, a, on a, I think, a very important aspect of King Kalakawa's um, legacy and uh, especially on his policy uh, to um, unify Oceania because that really, if, if you really um, uh, think about it, I think that's probably the most important of um, King Kalakawa's uh, legacy and, and, and of his, uh, probably the, the one aspect of his policy that he was most passionate about. So um, let's just um, go like a little bit over what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So first of all, I will just go a little bit and give it some background about what was Hawaii's position in the Pacific um, in just in general. Secondly, um, about the work of King Kalakawa's predecessors towards that, towards the, re the unification of Oceania because Kalakawa didn't entirely build it all by himself. He, he pretty much picked up and took it to the next level where his predecessors had done already a lot of work. And then third, we will look to the contributions during the first part of Kalakawa's reign, like before his trip to the world, his, his early reign, what he did there, which is probably the least known actually. And then fourth, the kind of the culmination when um, there was the Hawaiian Renaissance at home and the so-called new departure policy. Um, I'll explain that in, in a little bit what I mean by that um, uh, in, in its foreign policy. And then fifth, the uh, then implementing Oceania's unification on the ground, which is really like the, the first big kind of diplomatic mission into another island of Oceania that Kikalakawa commissioned. And then finally, we will look a little bit about the legacy, about the epilogue, like kind of how this, how this all ended, unfortunately, during, his, during his, his reign. And then, but also the legacy on how some of that lives on today and some of this can be picked up today again. Okay, so first of all, look at Hawaii's position in the Pacific. So, um, what is interesting, of course, is that uh, we need to all understand that, you know, Hawaii is not like, you know, it's not a, a, an appendix of North America somewhere in the, somewhere lost in the Southwest, like, you know, unfortunately, uh, most American maps uh, presented today, but it is actually an archipelago in the center of the Northern Pacific. And the kind of natural view from Hawaii is to just see, like, look to both seaboards of the Pacific and see Hawaii in, in, in the center. And that's exactly how people during the kingdom saw it. And that's how they represented uh, themselves or represented their country in their maps that they produced during the kingdom. Um, this is, uh, I think, the first uh, Pacific map that was printed in, ha in Hawaii. Um, this is uh, a part of the 1840 Lahaina Luna School Atlas. And uh, actually, interestingly enough, it starts with that map. That's like, if you open that as the very first map, is that one. And only then you get to the Hawaiian Islands. And then later you get to other continents, America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and so on. But um, really, like, before you even go to the Hawaiian Islands, you see, like, its location in what they call, what they refer to in, in Makaolele Hawaii as Ka'aina or Na'aina Moana, the island or the, the lands, actually literally the land of the sea or the sea land, the ocean land or the ocean lands. So you see it's kind of the same, I guess, in a way, a very similar word, like the word Oceania in, in, in English, right? Like a, a kind of a, a land or a continent that is based on the ocean, because obviously in the Pacific, most of it, most of the mass of the body of this Oceanian continent is actually water and, and, and not land. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a Hawaiian view from the 19th century, but equally interesting is to look at um, outside views, especially non-American ones, but European ones during that time, which, you know, very curiously actually, uh, you know, back up that same view. Um, so this is a map um, I found um, because I'm, I'm German. So I did some uh, research in, 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 in German publications and, and archives and so on. So this is a map that was done in 1859. So yeah, just 19 years later than the other one. Um, you know, given the long time of communications, pretty much right during, I mean, you know, shortly after, I will, I, one, one, might, one may say. And it's a map of Polynesia and of, uh, well, actually of the entire Pacific, like the Grosso Ocean, the Great Ocean. And it shows all the major powers that have possessions in the Pacific. Uh, of course, not as many yet as at the late, late 19th century. So we still have a lot of Pacific islands that are not claimed or not colonized. 
But of course, we have already here, um, we have the, uh, in Australia, New Zealand, India, the British possessions, right? We have the French are already in Tahiti and in New Caledonia. The Spanish are still in the Philippines and in Guam. Then the Dutch, the Netherlands are here in what's now Indonesia. Um, we have Russia all the way here in the north. Of course, Russia at that time is still uh, possessing uh, Alaska. They haven't, haven't sold it to the United States yet. Um, and so, and then you, but if you look at it, there's like these, there's six of these Western powers who are starting to colonize the region. Um, the, by the way, there's also American positions here. These are the so-called Guano Act Islands. These are small uninhabited atolls that the, that American um, merchants um, claim to, to mine guano. So that's another episode of, of American imperialism that's not well known, but it also, I guess, wasn't as consequential as the later wave in, in the 1890s, but like just to, point out that the U.S. was already had some some interest in, in the Pacific as, as early as that. Uh, anyway, so but back to these colors here. So there are like these, these six European or Western powers that have like started to colonize the Pacific. But there is a, a seventh uh, power of the Pacific here, and that is called Reich Kamehameha. So now Reich Kamehameha in German means as much uh, approximately means the empire of the Kamehameha. So that's the way that, that a German cartographer saw Hawaii. It was like the empire of the Kamehameha's, one of the, maybe the smallest, but nonetheless, one of the seven powers uh, powers in the Pacific that were at, at equal rank to, to the European powers, uh, which of course, uh, you know, entirely uh, is in sync with the narrative that, you know, you've heard probably before about Hawaii being like, you know, the only, the first and only non-Western country to be fully recognized. In. Here again, we have, besides the legal documents that we know, we have here just a cartographic evidence of that as well. And interestingly enough, other uh, uh, you know, powers in, in, in Asia, like China and Japan here, they are not marked. I mean, they're called Reich, like Chinesisches Reich, like Chinese Empire, but they're not marked, they're not color-coded because they are not, at that point, they are not recognized by the Western powers as independent states. Um, whereas Hawaii is, so that's like I'm pr probably a very, I mean, you know, one of the most uh, ex explicit uh, uh, document that, you know, that graphically shows like, you know, the Hawaii's special status as being the only recognized country and also being like a power in the Central Pacific. So keeping that in mind, um, we have during that same time the, the beginning of a uh, uh, policy um, from, uh, you know, emanating from the Hawaiian kingdom to to unify Oceania. And so this idea is um, maybe not the very first time, but certainly in the first kind of cohere in the first time coherently articulated actually by a um, Hawaiian diplomat um, in who was based in Sydney in, in what is now Australia, back then the British colonies. Um, and uh, by the name of Charles St. Julian. And that's the gentleman on the upper uh, right of this of this slide. And um, so uh, he wrote, uh, he communicated back with Honolulu and he uh, wrote a, um, a policy paper essentially uh, in, in the 1850s where he said that, well, I mean, Hawaii is really, it's, it, 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 uh, Hawaii is, it's Hawaii's obligation or kuleana to um, create a confederation of all the uh, remaining or like uh, all, the, all the still independent uh, or non-colonized uh, Pacific Island nations and create a confederation. And then if this confederation happens, it will be, and then has, has, I quote him, a power in the world. And he adds, not just in a symbolic sense, but in the actual sense, right? So there's this idea that if we have, if, if all this Aina Moana, if all this, all this, all this Pacific uh, space becomes unified under like, you know, under, under Hawaii, that's really when, when you know, it, it can be really a, 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 a power, a, a significant power. And um, so this policy then continues. Uh, so this was, of course, during the reigns of Kamehameha III and Kamehameha V in the, in the 50s. And then uh, later under Kamehameha V, um, uh, he continued that policy and uh, again um, had two advisors that were like instrumental in that who were like also, you know, developing this idea further and, and you know, assessing how this could be implemented. Um, and these were the, uh, the, these two European advisors that were both uh, ministers of foreign affairs at, at one point, um, uh, Charles de Varigny, a Frenchman, and Charles Harris, um, who was originally from, from uh, Boston, I think. Uh, so he was American originally, but not part of this missionary descendant crew that would later like conspire, but like, he, was, he was certainly loyal to the, to the kingdom. 
Um, so yeah, this kind of that's the that's the that's the pre like that's the history before like what was there in in the in the inner circuit of the kingdom. Now of course we come to King Kalakaua, and of course with King Kalakaua, it is interesting that um, he was you know not uh, he was not groomed to be king. That's 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 important to know about him um, because of you know we, we we know he was he was elected to the throne in a, in rather um, you know unusual well or or let's say well in constitutional circumstances, but, you know, rather unexpectedly in some way. So, um, and it had, of course, uh, you know, certain, I guess, some disadvantages because people, some people like Queen Emma and her supporters kind of questioned his, his uh, ability or his, 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 his lineage and all that. But at the same time, it had a lot of advantages too, because he was kind of a common citizen. Uh, well, not just a regular common citizen, truly he was of Ali Irang, but he was just like, you know, a government official, a high-ranking government official, so he could kind of see the inner workings of the government and also civil society, so he, he had various jobs in Hawaiian society before he was even even considered to to, to to become king, and that I think also sharpened his his instincts and sharpened his his, his mind and his, his political, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, abilities. Um, so uh, some things, uh, he was uh, in the 1860s a newspaper editor. He was one of the co-editors of the newspaper Kahoko Okapa Kipika. And that is a very important paper because um, this is the first uh, new paper Hawaii uh, that was entirely free of, uh, you know, American missionary influence. Um, so I'm not saying the missionaries controlled everything. That's of course wrong, but at the same time, it is true that, you know, the mission press was of course the first one printing newspapers and then even when the Hawaiian government uh, started printing their, their newspapers most of the editors were actually former American missionaries so there was always kind of a certain influence of of kind of missionary agenda in in Hawaiian language newspapers until 1860 uh, at least to some extent uh, and then with that one day for the first time it was just like you know it was just a group of of, of Kanaka or Ivi um, running their own paper and that's also when really the um, you know this kind of is in a way they grew really the start of the cultural renaissance during that time too because they you know they made it a point to publish traditional Hawaiian mo'olelo in their newspaper uh, and a lot of them like all kind of things that previously were like it was rather kind of marginalized a lot of the newspapers previously they were just either either news or uh, sometimes kind of Christian texts uh, and then this one, uh, you know, had just a lot of kind of literary and, and cultural kind of content that was like based on traditional Hawaii and, and, and therefore also, um, you know, safeguarding um, uh, our traditions by writing them down and, and all of that, which is well known, but really the, the Hoko Kopaki figure is the start of that and then other newspapers picked up that format. So really a very, very important uh, kind of juncture in the development of Hawaiian journalism and Kalakawa was right there at the beginning of that. And um, I have to acknowledge here also uh, Noi Noi Silva, who in her book has um, pointed that out really well, <coughs> how important that, that paper was in, in Hawaii's history. Now, um, in talking about the government, he was also a privy councillor under Kamehameha V, so he was kind of in the, really in the inner circle of, 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 of uh, running the country. And also postmaster general, so this building is still stands today, it's the post office that was built uh, during Kamehameha V reign. And so, yeah, here you just as an example, you see some of the news, some of the um, uh, stamps from the Hawaiian Kingdom, one with Kamehameha the Fourth and one with King Kalakaua. Oh, interestingly enough, these these stamps don't correspond to the reigns of these monarchs, because Hawaii found kind of the weather Victorian format to have just the one the monarch on the on every stamp. They found it kind of boring, right? Like British stamps, they have like you know they have just Queen Victoria. Maybe it's sometimes she's like looking to the right or to the left or whatever, or like green and blue and whatever, but it's always the same thing, pretty boring. Hawaii thought, no, we were just gonna put like all the, the main ali'i and we just like alternate their portraits. So you had Kalakawa actually on Hawaiian stamps even before he became uh, a king. You had Queen Lili, we had the Princess Lily Okalani already on certain denominations of stamps before she became uh, queen. And even during Lili Okalani's reign, you still had like portraits of, the, of Kalakawa, of, of Kamehameha V and, and others for certain denominations. So it was always kind of a, a very interesting kind of mix of various ali'i on, on those Hawaiian stamps. But anyway, it's just like, a, I'm, I'm a coin collector. Uh, I mean, well, coin as well, but I'm a stamp and coin collector. So it's particularly interesting in those kind of uh, things about, about Hawaiian history. But anyway, so uh, just to, to um, make a point here that Kalakawa 
uh, had various uh, experiences both in, uh, in, I guess, in civil society as a journalist and in, in, in the government. Um, so that really trained him uh, probably particularly well to then take the, you know, to become head of state. Now, unfortunately, we still have to think about one regrettable interlude right before his reign, and that was uh, during the reign of Luna Lilo. So um, Kamehameha V died without an heir. And uh, as far as I understand, he um, pretty much preferred already that Kalakaua would become his successor because he trusted him. There was, a, there was a, 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 one of his you know, uh, inner circle advisors. He thought that Kalakaua would continue his policies well and all of that, but Kalakaua was of lower rank where Luna Lilo was of much higher rank. And so the people uh, preferred Luna Lilo and most of the legislators, legislators uh, preferred Luna Lilo. So it was pretty clear that Luna Lilo would become the successor because of his popularity. And um, now, unfortunately, Luna Lilo was, um, you know, he was very popular. He also was probably, uh, I think, very kind-hearted, but he just, I don't think he was as politically savvy as either Kamehameha V was or Kalakaua was. So he, I don't think he was really the right person in terms of, of you know, savviness and, and, and you know, political, political acumen for that position. So, um, and... Um, I'm not so much criticizing his own personal policies, which I think were all good and well intended, but um, he just surrounded himself by the wrong people. And uh, one of the worst people he surrounded himself with was Charles Reed Bishop, who uh, Luna Lilo appointed foreign minister. And um, Charles Reed Bishop, um, unfortunately, even though uh, I know there's uh, some people, uh, some people at KS, well, not all, unfortunately, but some people at KS are still putting him on a pedestal as being like a great uh, bene uh, benefactor to Hawaii or whatever. But I mean, it's all complete nonsense. Uh, Charles Reed Bishop was a, um, you know, was a, a, a greedy businessman and, and uh, had absolutely no respect for anything Hawaiian from the very start of his career. Um, and he was from the very beginning, he was scheming to have Hawaii taken over by the United States, um, probably in, to further his own business and banking interests, most likely. Um, and so as foreign minister, he did a lot of, he did tremendous damage to Hawaii because he, um, he, he tried to completely refocus Hawaii's foreign relations to the United States. And uh, one of the things was he shut down all these Hawaiian consulates that had been opened under Kamehameha V, especially in Oceania, in, the, in various Pacific Islands. And um, St. Julian was no longer there, but his successor, Edward Reef, who had to uh, maintain this, uh, this, this position of being like the Hawaiian um, diplomatic agent to co coordinate like Hawaiian influence throughout Oceania and negotiate with all these different island states. Uh, Edward Reeve, like, like uh, he was being demoted to just being simply Hawaiian consul in Sydney because, you know, Charles Reed Bishop didn't want any of this pan-Oceanian policy to be in any shape or form uh, 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 move forward because he wanted Hawaii to be annexed to the U.S. And just like that was his whole thing from the probably from the very beginning. Um, now, fortunately for Hawaii, this whole interlude uh, lasted less than a year because, because Luna Lilo uh, uh, passed away uh, pretty soon and um, then uh, there was a new election and, um, and of course we know what happened in that election, um, that election um, King Kalakaua was elected, the new thing, king elected to the throne on February 12th, 1874. So King Kalakaua, when he was elected, um, and that is very, very important. Well, one of the first things was, of course, he fired, immediately fired Charles Reed Bishop um, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and um, then just merely four days after taking the throne, he you know, started to uh, reconnect and like re rebuild all these things that, that Bishop had destroyed and that Kamehameha V had started to build, namely those relationships with... Uh, with, uh, with other Pacific Islands. And so, like I said, merely four days after the taking the throne, he writes a letter to King Dakomba of Fiji, who previously, coming with the fifth, had, had, had established uh, close relations with, and also instruct the Hawaiian consul um, uh, to, resort, to resume these formal relations that, that you know, that has, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, really support Fiji um, in, in the face of, of, uh, of British uh, imperialism and, and try to really help Fiji to defend its independence. And unfortunately, it was too late because right, right during this kind of vacuum, when, when no support came from Hawaii, 
um, the British had kind of crept into Fiji and they had essentially start to, started to take over and then eventually compelled, you know, uh, Dakombao and, and to, to sign over uh, Fiji to, to become a British colony in, in, in late 1874. But still, it is if, as, as, as sad as it was, but it is interesting that like, you know, at the last minute, King Kalakaua, again, like as soon as he could, he like tried to step in and, and, and do something about that. So that's probably like the first act. Now, um, shortly thereafter, it turned the uh, attendance or uh, well, the, the attention of King Kalakaua was turned to Samoa. Um, so just a little bit of a backstory. In 1873, so this was during Lilo's reign, um, in Hawaii, uh, Samoan chiefs, pretty much just by themselves, uh, no Hawaiian influence at that time, they had formed a centralized constitutional government. And uh, these are some of the people here, like two of the high chiefs, Manitoa Laupepa and Tupua Tamasese Titi Maia. Uh, also, some of the kind of middle, lower-ranking uh, advisors, uh, uh, indigenous Samoan ad advisors, uh, Selu and, and Lema Mea. These were, like, uh, I think, the most important people in that Samoan government. And um, you know, collectively, they then reached out to an American um, diplomat and adventurer by the name of Albert Steinberger. And he, um, you know, he was, again was one of those Americans who were actually playing like a good role in the Pacific. So again, we don't, you know, we have uh, obviously, uh, uh, especially people in Hawaii, uh, for good reasons, have a lot of grudges against against Americans. But um, you know, we also need to uh, always be aware that that you know, out of America also came people who did who did good things in the Pacific. And um, I'm not saying more than out of Britain or out of Germany or out of France or whatever, but I mean, nonetheless, you know, it's like there, there's, there's no black and white here. It's not like all Americans are doing bad things in, in the Pacific. But so uh, Albert Steinberger for sure was 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 one of these uh, positive people, and um, he actually promised them American support and also uh, offered to negotiate on their behalf with the U.S. government. So that you know, at that time, the strategy of some one of these Samoan chiefs was that they would get recognition by by America, and then thereby they would get recognition by other powers, and therefore also create kind of an independent state, the same way that, that Hawaii had in uh, 40 or 30 years, 40 years earlier. Now, um, and then they actually appointed Steinberger to be premier. Um, now, um, one year later, like like I said, Kalakaua got elected to the throne, and then Kalakaua in in, in uh, late seventy four um, takes active interest in Samoa. Um, Steinberger, um, because he's going back and forth between the U.S. and Samoa, he always stops over in Honolulu, and each time he then confers with King Kalakaua, and King Kalakaua teaches him a lot about constitutional governance and other matters of statecraft in Oceania. So essentially, even though there's no Samoan at that point in, in Hawaii directly, but because Steinberger is commissioned by the Samoans, they trust him as their uh, emissary, and he kind of, you know, picks up a lot of this knowledge of Hawaiian statecraft and passes it on to Samoa. And at the same time, they, are, they formally ask King Kalakaua uh, for recognition, and he does uh, write them a official letter, which you see here, where he recognizes the Samoan government. And then also they start to negotiate a, between Steinberger and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Honolulu, they start a, um, a Samoan Hawaiian Friendship Treaty. Uh, this is the only draft manuscript that exists in, uh, in an archives in Samoa that I had like, you know, took like probably five years of my lifetime to finally like, you know, go through all kind of channels to finally be able to, to find this, to, to see this, 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 this manuscript. Um, now, unfortunately, again, this is kind of this whole, <clears throat> project is being cut short because in 1876 um, the British invade Samoa and again there's a conspiracy by certain uh, British settlers also some American settlers who don't like Steinberger they don't like the pro-native policy that he does and then eventually with this conspiracy of various European settlers who just don't like this kind of progressive Samoan state <clears throat> they, um, they uh, deport Steinberger um, uh, actually kid essentially kidnap him kidnap him and then uh, then the whole Samoan government that collapses and the whole project fails for the time being so but again Hawaii had like an important part in trying to help to build something there um, now of course um, also um, the uh, result of Hawaiian policy both under Kamehameha the fifth and the early period of Kalakaua is, is uh, that Hawaii is really uh, becomes really well established as a model in the region, and uh, we have these three constitutions, 
uh, in Fiji, 1871 and 1773, Samoa, 73, 75, and then finally Tonga, 1875, and they are all based on the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution. Um, the very interesting is the one in Tonga because um, in Tonga we still have, uh, I mean, the other countries got colonized in, in various ways and like, you know, had a different trajectory of the history, but Tonga still has this constitution with obviously a lot of amendments, but the today's constitution of Tonga is still about, I would say, maybe 70, 80 percent or so identical with the 1870, uh, I'm sorry, with the 1864 constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So that is kind of a very important thing. And, and people in Tonga today are also pretty much aware of that. So that is like an important legacy. Well, now talking about Tonga, um, after having copied Hawaii's constitution uh, a couple of years later, the um, uh, you know, Tupo the first, who also has a, a Westerner, uh, a Haole guy, as, or Palangi, as they would say, as a, as a chief advisor, um, uh, Shirley Baker. And um, now he, in the name of the king, reaches out and writes a letter to, to, um, to, the, to the Hawaiian government that they, Tonga also wants to have a treaty of friendship. And they want to have it modeled on treaties that Hawaii had already done with Britain and, and, uh, and Germany. So again, it's very interesting. Again, there's this, this, this awareness here that Hawaii is a power in the Pacific, not just these Western powers from the outside, but that Hawaii is like, it's very important if you are, if you want to establish yourself as an independent country, which Tonga was on its way of doing, uh, you need Hawaii to support you as well. And that's what they did. And now they, uh, Hawaii, Kalakaua responded very positively and um, the uh, Hawaiian, go Hawaiian government worked back. But unfortunately, at that time, again, there were trouble in Tonga. Tonga was not as stable as Hawaii. Um, there was all kind of internal problems. Actually, they tried some, certain people tried to assassinate Baker uh, at that time and uh, other troubles. So uh, it looks like Tonga was unable to follow up and um, because of that. And again, it was kind of a, you know, it was, it was an attempt and it was kind of a, it was, a, initiated but you know it, it was kind of first it was kind of stuck and it didn't didn't move on but nonetheless the, the the precedent was there and it was i guess something to be picked up later which i'm, I'm going to get into uh, in, in a little bit now um also during that time it was really during kalakaua's reign then that the um uh hawaii had first of all it had its um its highest number of diplomatic representatives all over the world. They were at the climax in 1887, before the bayonet coup, there were 103 Hawaiian embassies and, and diplomatic posts around the world. Um, and out of these, uh, there were quite a few in the Pacific. So I just want to go through some of these here by their uh, stamps that I found in various archives, both in Hawaii and in some of the island states. Uh, so first we have here in, in, in Australia, Kanikele Hawaii Ma Sydney. Then we have Kanikele Hawaii Ma Tasmania. Then we have this red one, it's hard to reach here. It's the Hawaiian consul in Newcastle. Newcastle is a, well, the various cities in the British Empire with that name, but this one is uh, north of Sydney in, in Australia, between Sydney and Brisbane, kind of half, halfway. Um, and then um, we also have on the far upper uh, upper right, we have Auckland, Kanekele Hawaii Ma Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Then here on the on the bottom, we have this is actually the original, like the stamp, you know, this, the the negative where right, you make the stamp with, right? If you make the seal with, that's where it's inverse. Kanekele Hawaii Ma Fiji. And then the yellow one, hard to read, is Hawaiian Consulate uh, in Samoa. And then we have this ink stamp here, which is the in French consulate, Hawaiian Consulate in Tahiti. Uh, at that time already under French rule. And then finally, we have one even in Micronesia. Um, uh, it says Hawaiian Commercial Agency. Now, commercial agency sounds like it's private and it's, it's, it's economic, but actually the term commercial agency was the lowest rank of a consular agency, right? So it is like, even though they use the term commercial, I guess because they're mainly concerned with commercial relations, but it's nonetheless a, not a private, but it's a public, it's a government position. It's, it's, it's a diplomatic office, right? And it was in Jaluit, Marshall Islands. So that's, uh, that's how it's connection to Micronesia as well. Now, um, I guess Kalakaua's reign can be probably divided into three parts. Like the third is the one after the bayonet, which I'm not really talking too much about, which is the sad part. But then the, the parts before is really, 
I guess really we can divide it into like before his, his world trip and then after his world trip. And the, the world trip is really one of the, I think, central uh, events in, in his life. And this is also the, really the event in which Hawaii, uh, again, wrote world history because uh, Kalakaua was the first head of state in the world to do a, a trip around the world. Of course, nowadays, every prime minister or president of pretty much almost every country will probably do this once in his, on his term. Because with jets, it's you know pretty easy to do. It takes like a few hours. I mean, well, a few days maybe. But um, in um, at that time, of course, it was very um, expensive and it took a long time. It took pretty much almost the entire year of 1887. So very few heads of state could either afford it, either financially or also like out of political expediency. They were worried that the coup would like dispose depose them if they were absent for too long and all of these things. So. It was a hard thing to do, but Kalakawa did it, and he, you know, thereby wrote uh, wrote world history. And um, now, like um, uh, like you can see on this map, he went to first to various countries in Asia: Japan, China, Siam, Hong Kong. Then he went to, to British India. Then he went through Egypt, and uh, then to uh, various European countries. Pretty much all the major ones: Germany, Austria, Hungary, France, Great Britain, uh, Spain, Portugal. Um, so of course Europe was important because these were the these were the world powers at the time. But I think the the most passionate and the most impressed Kalakawa really felt in the Asian countries, especially in in Japan. And that's the you know the picture up there where he has like where he's sitting together with uh, various <coughs> government officials of the Empire of Japan. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a picture of him and the Meiji Emperor. Uh, I wish that was just one day surface from the archives, but maybe nobody ever took the picture because uh, I don't know, even of Emperor Meiji as a whole, there are very few photographs, even even about just common kind of Japanese his historiography. There's like, you know, not very, very few portraits of Emperor Meiji. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so, but it is known from other sources that Emperor Meiji um, gave Kalakawa like the highest honors he ever gave to any visitor to Japan. Namely, he was, he let him like walk beside him and not one step behind like he would every other both domestic Japanese officials and also foreign visitors because they were all considered lower in rank than him but for Kalakawa no he actually accepted him to walk at the same at the same level when they took to when they um, were like inspecting a, a military parade in, in Tokyo and the reason he did it is because because Emperor Meiji <clears throat> considered just like all Japanese emperors, considers himself, considered himself to be a descendant of the gods, right, of, of the sun goddess Amaterasu. And um, because Kalakawa through the Kumulipo uh, also, um, you know, claimed descendants from, uh, from the gods, from the Hawaiian gods, from, from Papa and, and Wakea and, 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 and so on and so forth. And therefore, um, uh, you know, and, 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 and Meiji, Emperor Meiji respected that. So he saw like the connection here's, here. Here's another um, you know, non-European monarch who descends from the gods. So therefore they kind of, you know, they had that kind of equal uh, respect. And in the other, on the other hand, Kalakawa was really impressed by Japan in the sense of that we have another non-European country that is like modernizing, that is that creates kind of a modern state and, and will, at that time wasn't recognized yet by the West, but at, at one point would be. And so that was really like in, in many ways a model for, for, for Kalakawa, but also Hawaii being recognized was a model for Japan. So it was again, mutual in, in a way. And then similar in other countries in China, in Siam, even in Egypt, like all these countries that were like non-European and were in one way or another discriminated against by Westerners for being non-white people. Um, and so Kalakawa thought that um, he developed this idea that, you know, there should be like these, these West, these non-Western countries should bond together and form like a coalition of like Asian or Asia Pacific or, um, just like Asian and or Asian and African, like various ways of, of, of that. But, you know, he was really like uh, envisioning that. Uh, another kind of very close relationship uh, is that during his trip, he, he met the, um, the Maharaja Abu Bakar of, of Johor, which is now nowadays part of part of Malaysia. And when they met, they both rulers recognized that they have common cultural and linguistic roots, which today would be called Austronesian, right? Austronesian languages, there's a, a language group that both the Polynesian languages belong to, but also the languages of Southeast Asia. 
Malay, Indonesian, Filipino languages um, belong to that, to that group. And there are a lot of words that are actually, actually similar in, in, in those languages between, let's say, Hawaiian and Malay. And they were able to, they were, they were immediately recognizing that even, even if they had two different um, kind of, I guess, outside religious aff affiliations, right? Kalakawa was raised as a Christian. Abu Bakr, just like his Arabic name already says, was, was a Muslim, like, like the, most of the rulers of, 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 of Southeast Asia are or were. Um, but besides that, besides being kind of, you know, being influenced by two different kind of outside religious and, and cultural systems, uh, they recognize that they're actually their own, like indigenous heritage is actually very close, really closely related. And um, uh, Walter Murray Gibson, who was uh, later would become King Kalakawa's um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, at that time he was a, a newspaper editor, very favorable to King Kalakawa. He wrote um, that, uh, you know, this quote here, His Majesty recognized striking evidence of kinship between Hawaiian and Malay. And then King Kalakaua himself said about the Maharaja, If he could have spoken our language, I would take him to be one of our people. The resemblance being so strong. Yeah, so there you see like this, you know, this. Again, this is very important for the psychology of Kalakaua because he realizes also that you know, the, the Europeans always telling him, or like the Westerners, the Americans, the missionaries, all these people are always saying, oh, you know, the, the Hawaiians, it's just like a very small people, they're all going to die soon, and of the diseases, and it's like, you know, this is like these tiny, tiny the Poly Polynesians are so few people, they don't matter in the world, it's like a small, it's just lost, a tribe that's lost somewhere in the, in the small islands. And then Kalakaua realizes, no, it's actually like, you know, he's related to like the Malay people. It's like, it's like a hundred million already at that time, or maybe even more. And, um, you know, that like, there's a lot of connections that Hawaiians have, uh, even like genetically and culturally to other peoples in the world as well. And, you know, again, this is, I, I guess, probably was helping him to strengthen his, his also his commitment and his, his, his identity and his uh, dedication to, you know, stand up for his people and for his culture and for his for for his heritage and that's exactly what he did because when he came home um being so impressed by what he saw he um you know had this kind of you know pretty much these two policies that came hand in hand one the so-called hawaiian renaissance um namely the arrival of, of hawaiian cultural practices so many of you are, are know that right i mean you have the uh, the, the hula that came that came back as a major kind of part of, of, of ceremonies of state like uh, the, the, I think two or three days on a, in a row of hula that were performed for his coronation in 1883. This is a picture of that. Um, also that he published the Kumulipo. Um, this is the original uh, cover and first page of that. Um, now this is of course also I think a fascinating way of, 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 of you know, selective appropriation as some anthropologists call it, right? I mean, the, the, so the missionaries bring, right? The missionaries bring the printing technology to Hawaii in order to print Bibles and prayer books and those kind of things, right? To convert people with their foreign creed. And now King Kalakaua, just like he already did in the 60s with the newspaper, right? Kahoko Kapaki Pika. And now he takes it to the next level. He actually takes like the, the printing press to actually print a religious text a Hawaiian religious text that is non-Christian and uses that te that technology that the missionaries brought actually in order to, to convert people and to, to import another really a a foreign religion into Hawaii. So I think this is like, you know, really uh, like congenial ways of, 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 of using that modern technology to bring back kind of, you know, a cultural renaissance. And we have also the uh, Halenawa Society, which uh, Kalakama founded, uh, which is a um, I guess again, as a syncretistic way of, of combining both the you know traditional um, traditional uh, styles of organization, right? Halenawa originally was the the group of, of experts of, of of people who would validate genealogies of of, of Ali um, before their inter in internalization. And um, you know, so that's one part. But also, he was a Freemason, so he was also in, in involved by this kind of Western style of kind of esoteric esoteric western culture coming through the through free freemasonry and he was kind of combining that into this uh Halenawa or temple of science organization that he had kind of it was associated with with the palace and with him and his close circle of friends now while there was this cultural revival at home uh this is also being mirrored by a more assertive foreign policy by more assertive foreign policy and so you know you can really see how these cultural considerations now start to influence his policy making um and before we go into that, let me just briefly um, 
go over some of the supporters because Kalakaua, as great as he was, you know, nobody can do uh, uh, a great uh, a politics and, 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 you know, great statesmanship just by himself. So you need a, a team of people. And so just I uh, wanted to uh, also highlight and honor some of the people who were, who were his supporters and who were, who were loyal to him. Um, so I have just uh, a list here. This is not exhaustive. This is just like, you know, uh, the, like seven, uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, sorry, six. So six, um, six OEV on one side and six Howley on the other. That that came, that come to my mind, but it's like I said, the list is not exhaustive. So we have uh, on the on the on the OEV side here. You have John John Capena, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs for a long time. John Edward Bush, a newspaper editor, um, politician, and then also Minister of Foreign Affairs at one point. Uh, uh, also ambassador to Samoa. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Curtis Eokea, uh, Chamberlain, and also then chief diplomat. He's being sent abroad by King Kalakaua around the world again for a follow-up trip. Henry Poor, another diplomat who is first the assistant to Curtis Eokea on his trip around the world. And then in, later he's the assistant to John Bush in Samoa. So like a very key person in, in, in for, for diplomacy. And then the two half-brothers, Robert Huapili and John Tamatoa Baker, who are also uh, important people in the Hawaiian government and also very supportive of his Kalakaua's pan-Pacific policy. And John, John Tamatoa Baker is very interesting too because he actually continues that policy. He lives until the early 19, I don't know exactly when he passed, but in 1907, so a couple of years into the occupation already, he does another trip to the Pacific uh, to travel through all these different Pacific islands to, in a way, like, you know, continue Kalakaua's pan-Pacific diplomacy, even if it's now, he's now a private citizen and he's, you know, no longer obviously has that, that direct diplomatic influence, but it's almost kind of like a pseudo or like a para-diplomatic uh, effort, I think, what he did. And again, I have to acknowledge uh, another person here, another researcher, Kailani Cook, who uh, has found out about Tamatoa Baker and his trip. Like, I think without him, we would probably not even know about that. Um, so again, um, you know, acknowledge him here. Uh, on the Howler side, we have some uh, people. We have Charles uh, Harris, you already mentioned him. He was a, because he was a lawyer from, from, from New England. He was also very influential in, especially when Kalakawa was young and was, was a government official. Uh, Charles, Charles Harris trained him in the law. So. A lot of the kind of uh, legal knowledge that Kalakaua had that was important to as a, as a government official and as a head of state, he, he, he gained from, uh, from Charles Harris. Um, Henry Sheldon, unfortunately, I, I, don't, I didn't find a picture. He was a newspaper editor and he was uh, writing very favorably in the early, during the early reign of Kalakaua. He was a, he was a, a very loyal uh, uh, journalistic supporter who, uh, you know, wrote in English about Kalakaua's policies and, you know, tried to explain what was happening there and why it's important to do this pan-Pacific policy to, to English readers. Uh, and, uh, but, and he also had a half Hawaiian son who then later wrote the, um, the famous biography of Joseph Navahi in, in, the, in the late 1800s. So the Sheldon family is, is quite important. Then we have William L. Green. He's more of a complex character because um, as far as I can tell, he was very uh, supportive initially. He was, um, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I, as far as I can tell, he was loyal and, and doing uh, good things for Kalakaua. He was also working with the Hale Na Na Awa, uh, with the Hale, Hale Nawa Society. So he was sharing like, you know, scientific knowledge because he was also a, a, a scientist. Um, so he was, you know, he was in, in many ways, I think, uh, uh, a, a good supporter, but then I don't know what happened, but after 1887, he became part of the bayonet gang and actually like, you know, was, was, was part of those guys. So, um, I guess, you know, initially he was, he was, he was on the, on, on the right side later, unfortunately not, but I have kept, keep him here because in the, in the early part, I think he was, he, he was indeed an, an important supporter. Uh, and of course, we have Walter Murray Gibson, who uh, is maybe one of the most important of the of the of the Howley advisors. Um, he, uh, you know, supported him through newspaper articles very early on. He campaigned for him during his his campaign to the throne, um, and then he became Minister of Foreign Affairs and was really one of the main co-authors, I guess, of Kalakaua's Pan-Pacific policy in the 1880s. Um, similar, Celso Cesare Moreno, that was a, 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 an Italian. He was uh, in the early 80s. He was also um, advising King Kalakaua and also a supporter of a, of a Pacific, Pan-Pacific policy. And 
Finally, Joseph S. Webb, he is a British uh, subject from um, the Australian colonies, um, but he also played an important role in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, during the Pan-Pacific policy in the 1880s, so an another person. So these are just some, some, some important uh, people here. But um, finally, I think an important aspect that, you know, for King Kanakawa is also uh, artists. He, um, you know, arts, was an important aspect of him. It was not just politics, but also arts, like the cultural revival, the cultural renaissance went hand in hand. And there were also two very important um, uh, people here, um, uh, Isabel and Joseph Strong. Um, they were the most important court artists of Kanakawa. Um, so Isabel was um, really an ad avant-garde uh, 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 an artist who was like really beyond like, you know, I would say ahead of her time, you see this menu that she draw, like this menu chart, very kind of Art Deco style. So from the, for the, for the 1880s, this is really almost ahead of its time. I would, you would probably date this more like 1910s or so, like it's very, like extremely modern kind of artwork for the time. And she also designed the, this, the, the, the um, Royal Order of the Star of Oceania, Kahoku o Oceania. I'll get into that in a little bit, but she, she, she designed it too. And then his, her husband, Joe, he, uh, painted famous landscapes, for example, this uh, this one of the of the fishermen in um, in Waikiki, and he also was a photographer and he was uh, he documented the diplomatic mission to Samoa that I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit through his photographs. Well, then in the um, now we get when we get more into the 1880s, um, the connections to other Pacific Islands uh, increase. Now in 1882, 1883, we have correspondence with uh, Kiribati or, or the Gilbert Islands, as they were called then. So we have two kings or, or chiefs of two of these atolls who petition King Kalakaua. They write a letter to him and they actually ask him for Hawaii to annex their country or at least pro proclaim a protectorate. So. You know, we're talking about annexation as like something uh, Western powers do to Pacific Islands to take them over. But we also have here this idea that Hawaii actually should annex other islands and that, that leaders of those islands want that to happen. And I guess if you think about it, like these were small atolls, they were very vulnerable and, you know, you just needed one European ship. Um, didn't even have to be a warship, just like a, a merchant ship that was well armed and they could do like a lot of damage there. They could kidnap people to enslave them, uh, they could rape women, they could like, all these things happen, right? Like we see with, with the Europeans being let loose or, or Westerners, how the people being let loose onto, onto Pacific Islands at the time. And so I guess uh, having like a, a, a comparatively much stronger country like Hawaii, which had, you know, at least a few ships and at their own under their flag and had like you know had had, had you know much more manpower you know about a hundred thousand people and you know it was I, I guess it would would be it would make sense to some of these small atolls to uh, to uh, ally with Hawaii or to, to even be annexed by them and be, become part of the Hawaiian kingdom and therefore protect their people better so that was probably their, their motivation and because they did have experience bad experiences with slave traders in the 1860s uh, coming and kidnapping a lot of people from from their islands and so Kalakawa writes back, he, he wrote a letter back in, in, in Hawaiian, which you see on the, on the right hand side. And he is very interesting. He already kind of acknowledges that he is kind of going to rule over other Pacific Islands soon because he self identifies as Mo'i o Kuhawai Pai Aina and Meke Kahimau Ailana Polynesia, like king of the Hawaiian islands and of some other islands in Polynesia. Um, now he does, however, refuse to do this annexation because obviously he doesn't really know what he's getting his country into by doing that, right? I mean, it makes sense. You have to first check and, and examine and, and investigate this, this, this issue. But he does invite those two chiefs to come and attend his coronation in, in, at Iolani Palace and want to discuss these things with them for now. Unfortunately, I think they there is a certain error of judgment there on Kalakawa's part because these people, these, these chiefs on these small adults, they just didn't have the power, they didn't have the, the resources to do a trip on a boat like a couple thousand miles away and, 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 and attend the coronation in Honolulu. Um, so they didn't come because they, they didn't have the means to, to, to do that. Plus their own societies were probably not stable enough that they would keep the chiefly position if they were absent for like a couple of months from there, then, then some cousin would just take over, you know? So um, all of that, uh, Kalakawa and his supporters were 
probably not really fully aware of, unfortunately. So these guys never came. And then this whole thing kind of, uh, I guess, uh, again, didn't really go further. But um, in 82, yet another uh, um, Gilbertese or Kiribas chief, uh, Binoka of, of Abimama, he again pub uh, uh, petitioned Kalakaua. And this time, uh, actually much more uh, serious stuff. He wants them to give him arms and, and support him militarily so that he could conquer the other islands of Kiribati and become the Kamehameha of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of Kiribati. Now, that again, Kalakawa was, you know, not directly reacting to because, again, he didn't want to get involved in wars some, some, somewhere else and stuff like that. But again, this again shows how Kalakawa was being appreciated and how Hawaii was seen as a power, a power in the world that could actually matter in, in the region. So instead, what Kalakawa did, he sent uh, Alfred Tripp, Another um, uh, a ship captain who was who was uh, I think he was a Hawaiian national um, of British origin I think um, who um, uh, yeah he was commissioned uh, uh, to be a, a Hawaiian diplomatic emissary and he was sent to in examine and just investigate and follow up and, and meet with all these different uh, Gilbertese chiefs on these on these atolls and follow up now again we have unfortunately here um, you know again a bad fate here, I guess, because the mission is aborted because trip ship crashes on a reef on one of these atolls there. So they have to pretty much give up this whole thing and, and, and return home. But yet again, there's like, you know, the, the effort is there. So I guess what, we, we, what we're seeing here is a, is a, is a, is a constant, um, um, a constant um, will of, Pacific, of other Pacific Islanders to have Hawaii be involved as a protecting power for them. And we have also will of, of Kalakaua, especially, to do something about it and actually take up that Kuleana. It's just like always some bad circumstances prevented from like fully, fully uh, taking off. Now, all this being said, in 1883, um, Kalakaua and Gibson, who is now Minister of Foreign Affairs and again become, become Kalakaua's probably closest and most trusted and most personal advisor. Um, and um, they draft this, uh, this protest uh, and send it to all European powers in the world. And they protest against the colonization of the Pacific Islands, essentially saying that, you know, look, these islands should be left alone. No, no, none of you guys should take them over because look at us, we have developed into like a, a perfectly recognized modern state in Hawaii and you recognize us and we should give all these islands with our own support and guidance the chance to develop at the same, you know, to go, make, go through the same stages, also become internationally recognized independent states under our, under Hawaiian guidance. So that's essentially what they are saying. And um, now this is interesting enough. It was written on parchment, not on paper. Uh, it was written in an ink that I'm not sure what kind of ink that is because it just doesn't fade. Um, I went through, I saw copies of this in the German archives, French archives, and the Dutch archives, and it really looks like it was written like yesterday. It's like amazing for like something from 1883. Most of the paperwork from that time has faded, the ink has faded, the paper has started to crumble, all that, but not this one. So, you know, they, they spent a fortune in Honolulu to, 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 to make this and send it to, on, on like, you know, as, as a very, they took this very, very seriously. Um, to send this to to all all countries in 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 the, in the world. Now, at the same time, closer to home, um, Kalakaua is realizing too that he, you know, he's just there's, there's all this Pan Pacific policy, but um, even the uh, even the the country itself is not really fully unified yet. Uh, in the sense of that, of course, the, the eight islands are part of the of Koha Waipai Aina since since a long time already, since since Kamehameha the first, but. Um, the island chain still has kind of gaps that are not where the sovereignty is not clear um, because most of these northwestern Hawaiian islands were uninhabited and there this time this was before modern archaeology so you didn't have proof of Hawaiian settlement yet like in, in, in olden times so they were essentially considered empty and they're inhabited islands and pretty much anybody who went there and put a flag could claim them under international law at that time and um, so in 1886, um, Kamehameha, I mean, Kalakaua sends uh, Captain General Colonel James H. Boyd um, on a Hawaiian um, ship uh, to on the on the Hawaiian um, um, Navy ship Manuo Kauai 
to um, you know just go through this whole island chain and to claim the rest of these islands that are not under not clearly under international law recognized as being part of Hawaii or the half Hawaii and Kenyam yet and then so they go to the furthest end the island uh, Mokupa Papa also known as Kure or Ocean Atoll or Island and they formally claim that and put the Hawaiian flag on that. Now we have a problem there though, however, because the island before that, the second last in the chain, which is Midway, that one actually was claimed already by the United States. Again, under international law, that was a legal way because nobody lived there and um, Hawaiian ancient connections were really long time ago and probably Americans didn't even know that. Um, so the uh, Americans had claimed that in 1867 um, as a potential future military base. They hadn't built it yet, that, that one would only be built in the 1920s, but uh, you, the U.S. Had, had an internationally valid claim to Midway. And but Kalakawa was really bothered by that because he figured, he, he, um, he was sincerely convinced that the entire, Kohawa, the entire Pai Aina needs to be under Hawaiian sovereignty because um, these are all ancestral islands. You know, he had just published the Kumu, he, he was working on the Kumulipo, had to publish it yet, but was working on it. And he knew that like, you know, these islands are all, they are, have a very high spiritual significance. Um, maybe on top, he was also thinking about fisheries and just like the technical qualities of having a large uh, uh, maritime space. That was probably another kind of more, I guess, modern scientific uh, uh, reasoning, but certainly the spiritual, and cultural reasoning was very strong that that midway need like the the, the Pai Aina needs to be completely under Hawaiian control, and so he started to negotiate with the U.S. State Department and told them told them that you know we asked the Americans to give up that claim and turn that island over to Hawaii, and this was the first Cleveland administration and Cleveland as we know was an isolationist, not an imperialist, not an expansionist. So the uh, Cleveland administration was actually lending a positive ear to that and they were starting to negotiate this turnover. So again, if Bayonet hadn't happened in, in, in mid-1887, probably Midway would have eventually been turned over to Hawaii because it also didn't really have that, that important strategic significance to the U.S. at that time. And during this non-imperialist administration, they were not that interested in keeping it. So, you know, again, this is like very like far-sighted. Kalakaua really wants to make sure that the territorial integrity of, of the Pai Aina is, is intact. Now, in late 1887, then King Kalakaua founds the Royal Order of the Star of Oceania. Um, like I already mentioned, the, the designer. It's um, it's done um, in recognition of services, you know, relating to the to the to the Pacific Ocean and, and, and Polynesia. And um, again, I have to acknowledge another friend of mine, uh, Teahi Lee, who one day su suggested to me, which I never thought about, but that this is actually a very close re reference probably to the newspaper title, because remember Kahuku Okapaki Pika, right? The star of the Pacific. And on this order, it, has, it says Kahuku o Oceania, the star of Oceania, so very, very similar. And of course, Paki Pika and Oceania mean essentially the same thing. So. Probably he came up with that name. I mean, I have, don't have the proof, but uh, I, it, very likely he saw this also as a as an extension of what he previously had done with this with his newspaper back in uh, before he became king. So um, that's kind of my my theory of, of of how he came up with that specific name. Now, if you look at the statues of that order, they're very interesting too. I, I have them here, Makaola Hawaii, and in English. Um, in the interest of not going on forever here, I uh, will not read the Olala Hawaii. For those of you who are Hawaii, you can, of course, pause this and then just read it. But I will just read aloud here the, the English version. Uh, it says, the Star of Oceania, the Order of the Star of Oceania is hereby established for the recompense of distinguished services rendered to us or to our state and in advancing the name and influence of Hawaii amongst the native communities of the islands of the Pacific and Indian Oceans and on contiguous continents. I think two things are, are striking here. First of all, his definition of Oceania is not just uh, islands to the south in the Pacific, but also islands in the, all the way to the Indian Ocean, which has to do obviously with his experience in Malaysia during his trip around the world where he met, where he Notice that the Malay people of Southeast Asia are also closely related and are also 
uh, Oceanians, in, uh, more or less, uh, to him, and um, even all the way to Madagascar. There's some correspondence with Madagascar as well um, at one point. I'm not going into this here, but Madagascar is close to Africa, to East Africa, but it's also Australian speaking, has a language very closely related to Indonesian and, and, and Malay. So essentially he thinks about like this entire like Indo-Pacific, I guess, as we use the term today, he thinks of that as like being uh, kind of the, the, the Oceania in which Hawaii should play a leading role. Um, also interesting is that he doesn't talk about states or nations, but he talks about the native communities. So that I think again is something that's really important and ahead of its time. That you know we're talking today, we're talking about indigenous rights, indigenous communities, and 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 all of that. And you know again here we have King Kalakaua, 130 or 140 years uh, before us, and he is essentially uh, uh, creating a very similar discourse here. That it's not the main thing is not states and nations, even though he obviously is proud to be the head of one of those that is recognized, but he also extends this idea of, of, of pan-oceanianism and of, of international relations, not just to states that are recognized, but also to native communities, like, or as we today would say, indigenous communities. So that I think is, is, is very important to, to, to think about. Okay, now finally, um, um, that being said, uh, he, uh, after having founded that order, he now finally uh, gets to put this theory to practice. And in early 1887, he sends the An Hawaiian diplomatic embassy, uh, consisting of, of um, Edward Bush and Henry Poor, and also the Hawaiian warship uh, Kaimiloa, uh, the first uh, navy ship that that is like you know a full full navy ship. Um, and they sent them to Samoa in order to defend Samoa's independence against Western imperialism. Because at that time, Samoa is, like I said, ever since this, this British intervention of 1876, when they destroyed the Samoa and the first Samoan government, Samoans are struggling, trying to, to form their, their kingdom, modeled on Hawaii, but the Western powers are constantly interfering and like messing it up in one way or another during that time. And in order to strengthen Samoa and, 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 and put it back on that on the on the path of developing towards a kingdom based on Hawaii, they, they, that's one of the reasons they sent to the Hawaiian diplomatic embassy. And here you see on board the Kaimilo, you see Maliatoa, that's the one with the with a feathered um, feathered uh, bicorn hat, um, and the big epaulets. And on his on his breast, he he wears the Royal Order, the, the Grand Cross of the Royal Order of the Star of Oceania that he had we had just been awarded. Then next to him, Bush, also with the, with the bicorn head, and then Henry Poor to the, further to the right. So these are the two Hawaiian diplomats. And then on the other hand, you see uh, three naval officers of, um, of the Kaimiloa, Hawaiian naval officers who were also part of that team. And um, just within a very short time in February 1887, then um, Malietoa and King of Samoa, Malitua, Malitua Laupepa, and Bush for a Hawaiian ambassador, they send a treaty of political confederation. This is the original, the Samoan ratification uh, copy of it in the state archives in, in Honolulu. And this is again a very important thing because we are talking about uh, those of you who follow like occupation discourse and, and um, uh, the things Skiano is doing and, and other people that, you know, we, we have a very strong argument that the treaties that the Hawaiian Kingdom signed were never canceled. Um, and so this is, of course, important in relations with Switzerland, Belgium, France, other, other European powers. And it's, you know, it's being tested, in, has been tested in, in certain cases and it is being tested. But we also have that for Samoa. So again, this treaty was never canceled. So again, Samoa uh, is actually under international law in a, in a treaty of confederation, is, is in a political confederation with Hawaii. So that is an important thing too, that, that you know, uh, I don't know what we can do out of that practically right now, but it is certainly something that at one point probably will, uh, somebody will get back to and it will have some very interesting Im implications. Um, so this is really, so here really we have, we have the start of this Polynesian Confederation. It was not a dream of Kalakaua, it was something that the first step was actually done and it was signed. At least we have two, car, two countries in this Confederation, Hawaii and Samoa. Um, now the problem is of course, like I said, they are very, Samoa is not the same society as Hawaii. It doesn't have really a centralized kingdom. It has like various high chiefs with, with high ranks and they are 
it's a very complex system that is kind of very decentralized and has a lot of these village councils that play a lot of play an important role and chiefly titles that are not inherited but that are awarded by village councils so it's a very complex system that's not as centralized as hawaii is or was traditionally so um, taking that into account they the both the kaimiloa and these two hawaiian diplomats they have to really travel around and meet have various meetings like very very lots of meetings in the various villages to make sure that all these village councils are on board of that and that they all consent to this to this from polynesian confederation because maliatoa signature alone is not really that you know doesn't really count that much you need to implement it on the ground and they do that here so he's a one of the meetings that they have in the village of Luffy Luffy with uh, Mata Afa and one, one other high ranking chief, probably the highest, second highest in rank after, after King Valietua. Now, the Polynesian Confederation then goes further because, um, or is planned to go further. Now, Bush is also instructed to then continue to go to Tonga and deliver a letter from. Kalakaua to George to go. Unfortunately, the only copy we have is this is this TypeScript. Um, and then, um, so they are here supposed to to uh, conclude this treaty, friendship treaty that they had, like to follow up with this with this 1881 1880 uh, 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 aborted negotiations to have a treaty. And then, but and also, besides a bilateral treaty, they also want to, want to invite Tonga to actually join the Polynesian Confederation and be like uh, be part of it and then extend it to to. Hawaii, Samoa, and Tonga. Um, then the next is all in, in, in Bush's diplomatic instructions is that he should then continue to the Cook Islands. Um, there's here's one of the leading uh, chiefs there, Queen Makea of uh, Makea Takao of, of Rarotonga. And um, so he's supposed to uh, go there and then also negotiate with them to join the Confederation. Then finally, he's also to follow up with his aborted uh, trip diplomatic mission of 1883 and also uh, follow up with the chiefs of Kiribati and um, again either invite him to the confederation or annex them actually all right all the way to Hawaii according to what some of them had previously requested so anyway he's supposed to go there and check that out and and and, and just like follow up with that there as well so um, that's pretty much where we were and then unfortunately it all ends and that is because we have two sad events that happen almost concurrently and that is like essentially the German Navy and American missionary sons in Honolulu these are the ones see that these are the culprits they are then essentially destroying the Polynesian Federation so in Germany uh, uh, in Samoa Germany threatens to declare war against Hawaii because they say they are interfering in Samoa which is of course ridiculous because they come from the other side of the world and if anybody interferes in Samoa it's the Germans and uh, Hawaii is not interfering it's just helping their their Polynesian brothers um, but here you see that there's the Kaimiloa in the front and in the back you see the two German warships kind of lurking in the back so kind of ready to attack essentially and that's pretty much what they do and in, in August 1887 they really invade and occupy Samoa they kidnap Maliatoa take him to to Germany um, and then they install a pro-German rival to be a puppet king. So that's pretty much what ends this implementation on the ground of, on, in Samoa. At the same time in Hawaii, they have also in the summer of 1887, they have the, you know, what's called as the Bayonet Coup um, missionary party. The same people who then got involved in the overthrow a couple of years later, like Thurston, Dole, W.D. Alexander, all these people, Sereno Bishop, like all these names that we that we know of, Charles Reed Bishop in the back funding it all. So, um, you know, these these people, they they um, they they you know they 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 do a coup d'état against Kalakaua, and then they have their their militia, the so Honolulu Rifles, uh, which they don't have in 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 '93. They don't have that anymore. So that's why they need American military navy to invade and do that for them, but. In 1887, they do have their own militia and uh, they do uh, conduct that coup and then force Kalakaua to sign that bayonet constitution uh, where he has to give up most of his powers. And um, the new cabinet under the bayonet constitution then uh, immediately recalls the diplomatic mission from Samoa and completely terminates this pan Polynesian policy like once and for all. So that's how this unfortunately ends right when it was like starting to flourish it gets it gets unfortunately uh, ended 
However, um, Kalakaua is not completely dispirited by that because he continues to be interested in uh, reconnecting with Oceania. And I have like, found a very interesting document in the French archives um, because in 1887, uh, Kalakaua was actually planning to visit Tahiti and, re and, and reconnect relations with the royal family there. So the situation in Tahiti is that King Pomare V is still king, but it's already under French overrule. So the French are already in Tahiti, pretty strongly implemented. But um, he is anticipating King Kalakaua to visit him. And so he writes to the French government and asks him for permission to create a royal order of Pomare. He has, he has a design here attached to it. So it looks, looks pretty, pretty nice. Um, and, um, you know, because he anticipates that King Kalakaua will give him the, the royal order of the Star of Oceania, he wants to have something to reciprocate. Now the French say, no, you can't, you, 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 you gave up your country, you are a French colony now, you are, you don't really have the, we don't give you the right to do that. So unfortunately, again, it doesn't, doesn't work out. But again, I think this is an important piece of evidence, again, how the reputation of Kalakaua really kind of precedes him everywhere in the Pacific. And almost every Pacific ruler really wants to do something, wants, some, wants to have some kind of relationship with Kalakaua. So that's how, that's how, how, how important his reputation was throughout the Pacific. And, and not just his, obviously, but Hawaii is now the Hawaiian kingdom as a, as, a, as a country. Now, to finish, I would like to um, just end in his own words. It's always easy to judge people, both positively or negatively, by other sources or like, you know, um, anecdotal evidence or, or whatever, but it's, I think it's always important to listen to the people themselves, what they say. So I just want to give him, uh, you know, give the floor to him for the, for, for this, for this ending here. And then uh, have two quotes of him. him. One is in Tokyo when he meets the Meiji Emperor of Japan and he, he says, it is imperative for the countries of the East, in which he includes Hawaii, to form a league to maintain the status quo in the East, in this way opposing the European countries. The time for action has come. So this is kind of this initial statement of where he thinks that all these non-Western countries need to bond together because that's the only way of, of, of fighting against the European imperialists who want to just take over the entire world. And um, interestingly enough, this, 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 kind of, uh, this type of manao, which is later called Pan-Asianism, and there are a lot of intellectuals in Japan, in China, in, in other parts of, of Asia in the early 20th century who write kind of similar statements. So it is kind of the, but here again, we have Kalakaua. He's not even Asian, he's Polynesian, but he's pretty much the one, the, the pioneer of this idea of Pan-Asianism that gets picked up like a couple of decades later by, by Asian in, intellectuals. So again, you see how far ahead of, of his time he was. And then finally, in 1889, this is of course against uh, after the bayonet coup. Um, you know, the propaganda already starts right uh, pretty much after 87. The propaganda against Kalakaua starts. Um, I really recommend, by the way, reading um, Tiffany Ng's book uh, about reclaiming Kalakaua because that's a really good um, analysis of how Kalakaua has been kind of systematically maligned by the people who did the bayonet coup against him. And they really tried to like systematically damage his reputation. And they started right after 1887 to do that by various publications. And so one of the things they were trying to do is to blame Kalakawa and say he was an imperialist. Like he would, they were just, you know, again, I guess trying to justify European or Western or American imperialism by saying, well, you know, Kalakawa was just like imperialism is just the way to go. Powerful countries take over smaller ones. So if America, you know, America should do that to Hawaii, but you know, it's the same thing because Kalakaua himself did it, right? He was trying to take over these small islands and make a, become a Polynesian imperialist or like a Hawaiian imperialist. So right, that was kind of the, the spin they were, they were doing in order to justify their own imperialism. And uh, Kalakaua already in 1889, when these, these rumors or these, 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 these interpretations were being spread, especially in the American press, um, he was defending himself and he was saying, no, this is actually not, this is like, this was, this was, this was altruistic. That was, this was not a means of imperialism. And so here he said, of course, did I send Bush? Of course I did send Bush, like the Hawaiian ambassador to Samoa. But it was from a repeated call from Samoa, as well as all the other South Sea Islands, a call of, a call of confederation or solidarity of the Polynesian race. 
our mission was simply a mission of philanthropy more than anything, right? So here you have like that uh, very clear statement about the purpose of, of all of that. Now, before we end, I just want to talk a little bit about the legacy because, you know, we, we might ask ourselves, like, what does this mean? Like, I mean, you know, this was like, it was like 140 years ago. Kalakaua passed away 131 years ago. Um, but, you know, how much legacy is there? Of course, there's a legacy in Hawaii. We all know that. We know that Hula is, wouldn't be what it is today. Hawaiian music wouldn't be what it is today without him. We have the Merry Monarch named in his honor. We have the palace that's still there as a symbol of, of Hawaii's sovereignty that he built. So his legacy in Hawaii is, is very clearly there. But what about the legacy of this pan-Polynesian, of this already pan-Oceanian or pan-Pacific policy? Well, that one is there as well. And um, it, it turned, came to my attention. I wasn't even fully aware of that before, but in 2011, um, the Prime Minister, then Prime Minister of Samoa, now retired, Tuila Epa Sailele Mali Lengaoi, um, he um, spearheaded the formation of a um, international organization called the Polynesian Leaders Group that was like um, meant to have like people from the triangle of Polynesia, from the different different countries and territories to, to meet annually and to kind of formulate common policies. Um, they're especially involved in the issue of climate change, right, because most Polynesian countries are small and relatively vulnerable in terms of their, their, their land masses. And some of them are atoll nations. They're just like Tuvalu or Tokelau uh, threatened by, by, the, by the sea level and all that. So for all these purposes, they created this Polynesian Leaders Group. And um, he was then interviewed by a journalist from the Samoan government newspaper, Savali. And, you know, maybe it's a coincidence, but I would say it was meant to be. The interview took place on November 28th on Laku Okoa, right, on Hawaii's national holiday. And um, so when they asked uh, Tuila Epa about, you know, where, where does this idea come from that to federate or like to create this association of Polynesian countries, he said, it's not a new group, it's not a new idea. The idea of a Polynesian confederation dates back to the 1880s, over a hundred years ago. It was the height of imperialism in the Pacific and King Kamehameha, well, he, he meant Kalakaua, I guess he got that wrong. Maybe the journalist got it wrong, I don't know. Of Hawaii, King Pumare of Tahiti, Malietoa Laupepa of Samoa, and King George Tupo of Tonga agreed to set up a confederation of Polynesian states at the time. Envoys from Hawaii were received here in Apia, that's the capital of Samoa, where Bush and Poor and the, the Hawaiian uh, Navy ship went to, and agreements were signed. And so here you have the, the awareness among another Polynesian leader of this policy. And the dating is important because if you think about it, uh, we have Kealani Cook, who wrote about this in his book, Kaiki, um, that came out, I think, in 2017. Um, you have uh, my own book, A Power in the World, that talks about that. It came out in 2019. So before this research from, this recent research from Hawaii that focuses on this Hawaiian pan-Pacific policy, before this research came out, um, the Prime Minister of Samoa made that statement. So obviously it was not influenced by recent, ac recent academic research out of Hawaii, but it was like probably some deep-seated knowledge that people in Samoa uh, kept of this, you know, probably through oral tradition and, 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 and other means. So, um, you know, this is, I think, a very, very important and very, um, you know, uh, uh, how would I say that, um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a very deep kind of, kind of uh, uh, impression here, right, that people, that this has been preserved and people are aware of this. And, you know, when the time comes, I guess it's, it's being resurrected. And, and uh, at that time, originally the Hawaii was not part of that. It was uh, it was the um, it was just the kind of Southern Pacific uh, nations, both independent countries like Samoa, but in Tonga, but also uh, overseas territories like dependent territories, colonies like French Polynesia was part of it, American Samoa as uh, as well. But Hawaii was not originally part of it. But a couple of years later, um, Hawaii did join. And this is like another meeting here, another. Uh, uh, a, a group portrait on the, the, the right and the left, I mean, sorry, in the right corner. Um, and there you have on the, on the far left, you have Kamana Opono Crab, who some of you in Hawaii might know. He was uh, CEO of OHA at that time. 
and he is actually quite famous. Um, unlike your typical OHA bureaucrat, uh, he was actually making uh, big efforts to um, incorporate uh, the whole occupation narrative into OHA's policy. And he, uh, you know, he's famous, some of you might know, he wrote a letter to the U.S. Secretary of State asking about, you know, the, 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 the non-existing treaty and the fact that Hawaii is not part of the U.S. and that, um, you know, all of this thing is kind of Hawaii status is in limbo. And, and, and he got into big trouble for that, but is, I guess, also seen as a hero by many, by many Hawaiians for that reason. And anyway, so he was the one who then uh, became Hawaii's delegate to, for that, for that group that for the leaders group. So there we have, and in a way, kind of, you know, the, the circle, you know, the, the circle closes eventually by Hawaii joining back into to this, which eventually, which originally Hawaii under Kalakaua had, had, had originally created. Well, I have talked uh, for a long time and I think uh, that's it. Um, mahalo Nui for listening to me. And um, again, um, I hope this was a, um, useful contribution to honor uh, Kamui Kalakaua on the day of his passing. And um, I wish you wherever you are, um, whoever you are listening to this, wish you all the best. And, um, you know, I hope for um, that we can all make some good contributions in one way or another to resurrect King Kalakaua's vision and, you know, keep up his legacy and take it to the next level. Hello. Hello.